I'm Shannon Tiezzi with The Diplomat, and I'm here today at the Council on Foreign Relations, where I'm happy to be joining Dr. Sheila Smith, who is a senior fellow here at CFR and the author of Intimate Rivals. Dr. Smith will be talking with us today about the recent snap election called by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Um, on December 14th, Japan went to the polls, and the ruling LDP has held on to its majority. But Dr. Smith, does this mean that Prime Minister Abe has actually received the mandate he was looking for? Well, I think he has. And he's, he established this, this snap election really as a mandate on Abenomics, his economic agenda, policy agenda. And I think when he announced that he wanted to have this, this snap election, he said, we are willing to lose 20 to 30 seats. He didn't quite put it so bluntly, but he implied that. They, they figured they may lose some seats, but that they would come back with a ruling coalition that would have a majority in the, in the lower house. What he's done is with this ruling coalition has led uh, to the victory uh, in the two-thirds majority now. So he's in a pretty good legislative position. Does the low voter turnout at all influence the way Abe thinks about this um, mandate? I suspect it does. I mean, he was elected in 2012 in December. Uh, he had a 59 percent participation in the vote. And everybody looked at that number and, and wondered whether or not that was, that was really going to temper his enthusiasm for certain projects. Um, but really, that was the lowest number in the post-war period, 59. It went below 60 percent for the first time. Uh, and this time, he had a 52 percent turnout for the vote. We can explain it. Uh, I don't know that this really undermines his confidence in the Abenomics agenda, but I think it must give him pause. And as you mentioned, this election was mostly framed as a referendum on Abenomics in particular, um, specifically the decision to delay a scheduled tax increase. So now that he has received this mandate, what are the prospects for Abenomics moving forward? Well, I think he's got, he, he describes Abenomics as having three arrows, right? The fiscal stimulus is the first, the second is the monetary instrument that in, implemented by the BOJ. Um, and he will now turn, I think, to the really serious issues, which are really structural adjustments inside Japan. He has begun uh, what he calls that package, it's a third arrow, structural adjustment. He's begun by reforming agriculture, by beginning to address the tax structure, and the consumption tax is only one piece of that puzzle. Uh, but he also has to think very seriously about revenue, uh, not, not only revenue, excuse me, about spending, government spending. And that's where the balancing act is going to come. As you know, Japan's demographics suggest that the fiscal burden of dealing with an age aging population is only going to get heavier. Uh, so he's going to have to make some trade-offs in terms of social security reform as well. Mm -hmm. So he's got a huge uh, set of issues. None of them are going to stimulate growth all by themselves, but he really has to readjust the way in which the Japanese think about the role between the government and the private sector. Despite this um, victory in the election, mm -hmm. I would imagine this is still going to be politically very difficult. Do you think he'll be able to actually push these reforms through? Well, I think it's a step-by-step -step process, obviously, and he'll need as much political support as he can get. He'll need a lot of support from his coalition partner and some of the trickier pieces of legislation going forward. But I think the next, the very short term between now and, and next April, which is when the next Japanese fiscal year begins, he'll be composing a budget. And that budget will, will get a sense of just how he's going to play off some of these priorities in that budget-making process. Mm -hmm. He has not backed away, of course, from the consumption tax. It will be implemented in 2017. So the window between now and 2017 is really when he needs to, the Japanese economy to be kick-started. He needs demonstrable economic growth between now and 2017 so that that tax increase will be, will be manageable for Japanese households. So do you think this election represents a real vote of confidence in Abenomics, or is it more, let's wait and see, we don't have a better option? I think it's the latter, frankly. And even the LDP, they, were, they weren't quite putting it that way. But they were campaigning on, this is the only way forward. It's not really we're the only, we don't have a better option, but it's a little bit the same story, that, that this is the way forward and this is the only way forward and please stick with us is really what they were asking for. It's interesting when they went out to campaign in the rural areas, uh, they were talking mostly to voters that are longtime LDP supporters. They are people in areas that really where the economy is faltering, has been for some time. They've been depopulated. Younger people have left the rural, rural Japan and moved to urban areas. And it's also where the agriculture and fisheries industries are. These two are fairly declining industries in Japan. So part of what the campaign that the, the LDP and both LDP and Komeito launched was really to say, rural Japan, don't worry. 
we're going to revitalize you. We're going to give you uh, help in the small and medium businesses. Mm -hmm. We're going to help you too get back on your feet. And so it was really asking them to have patience. Uh, and I think they were rewarded with that request. So we've talked a lot about Abenomics, and that was really the major issue for this election. But Abe has also pushed through some fairly controversial uh, reforms in the security realm. Mm -hmm. You have the new collective self-defense interpretation of the Constitution. Um, you also have a push to restart nuclear power. Mm -hmm. uh, were these issues at all on voters' minds as they headed to the polls? Of course. And I think, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I would completely call it a security policy uh, area, but, but nuclear power is certainly one of the troubling issues issues will be one of the more difficult hurdles for the Abe cabinet going forward. As you know, after the triple disasters in, in 2011, there's been a growing, slowly growing uh, popular distaste for nuclear power in Japan. Uh, and I think now there's, a, there's still a lot of concern in the localities that host nuclear power plants. They both depend on them economically, but they're also very worried about safety regulations and whether or not the government is really capable of ensuring their safety if they restart the reactors. So there will be a couple of decisions being made. There's been one locality that has agreed to come back online. There's another coming up before the end of this year, and there'll be some conversations early next year with other localities as well. Some people think this is a domino effect, that once you get one started, the others will come along. But I think it's going to be a case-by-case, -case, locality by locality effort. On the security side, I think, yes, the, the Abe cabinet has, in the last year or so, saw its popularity, uh, the approval rate of the prime minister dip suddenly when it's tried to push in certain directions. And you mentioned the collective self-defense announcement on July 1. That was the lowest dip uh, in the prime minister's approval rating. So I suspect that the, the debate on collective self-defense will continue to be managed very carefully by the LDP and by their, their coalition partner, Kometo. So how are they going to balance the need for support from their coalition partners on the economic agenda with some of the um, friction that they have on the security front? Well, I think on the economic front, the Kometo has, uh, is an important partner here because the Kometo has always been focused uh, very much on, for example, in the consumption tax debate. It was very focused on what, would it be all right to have exemptions for elderly or for impoverished families? We don't have a lot of impoverished families in Japan, but you have families that are below the median income, the acceptable income, right? Um, so they've, they've, they've sought to protect the poor, that protect the elderly, and protect certain communities that, that may need some protection from this tax. They also advocate um, strong social, su social supports, excuse me, for growing families, so child care. Uh, they're very much focused on some of those social security issues, and so they temper, I think, some of the impulses of the LDP. On the security side, I, the, you can say that the Kometo has really been the break on Mr. Abe's vision for reinterpreting the Constitution. Uh, Mr. Yamaguchi uh, has been very clear that he wants to see a very moderate and cautious uh, relaxation of the constraints on Japan's military. And he's willing to consider certain circumstances that are necessary for Japan's defense. But if anything, they are the cautious part of that coalition. And so I think the laws will reflect that. So we've talked about uh, the LDP and their prospects. Let's turn to Japan's main opposition party, the DP Pe DPJ. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Given their showing in this election, what are the real prospects for having a viable opposition in Japan moving forward? Well, the DPJ, as you know, was in power from 2009 to 2012. So they're the one opposition party in Japan that has experience in government. And they were also in power at, when Japan faced two of the worst crises of the post-war period. One was the exacerbated tensions with China and a serious risk right, of, of some kind of military action between the two. Um, and then the other was, of course, the triple disasters in 2011. So the DPJ was inexperienced when they came into government, but they were, they were really forced to become very experienced very fast in these two situations. Um, they're, they're, they have suffered in the last two elections, not this one last past Sunday, but the, in 2012 and in 2013 elections, the DPJ really was uh, hurt at the polls. And so there's still a kind of leftover kind of antipathy by the Japanese public about their time in office. This time, they managed to pick up 11 seats. So I suspect we're at a moment when the DPJ may be coming back, um, really, to, to talk to the Japanese people about their vision for the future. The leader of the party, however, lost his seat. Uh, so there will be a leadership race in the DPJ, and I think this is the moment where the party will have to define itself clearly 
as what it wants to be going forward to the, for the Japanese public. And what other opposition parties should we be keeping an eye on as we move forward? Well, there's a, another opposition party, the Japan Innovation Party, the Ishin Noto. Uh, they were expected to lose quite a bit in this election, but they managed to hold their own. They lost a couple of seats only. Um, they are a, a reformist party as well, but with very different inclinations than the DPJ. Uh, they want more local autonomy. They're very supportive of a, of a very different type of government in Japan. Um, the other party to keep, keep your eye on is the Japan Communist Party. They are the ones that really came out ahead as an opposition party. They went in with eight seats. They came out with 21. They can now put legislation now on the floor of the Japanese parliament where they couldn't before. Uh, many people think of them as an ideologically driven party. Obviously, they're the Communist Party. But I think they're now the veto party in Japan. They're the opposition party that most Japanese think will actually be able to have the backbone to say no to the LDP. So I think we should watch the Japanese Communist Party as well. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Smith. That was a great rundown of Japan's domestic politics. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us. And I'll see you next time on The Diplomat.